their their fundamentals are are not thought through. They don't have the, the foundation. So you can you know if you want to build a 10, 20, 30 story building, that's fine. But if you don't get that foundation right, you know life is not going to work for you. So I think it's one of the things that I can uh, add uh, you know uh, to uh, to this that. Uh, a lot of the people, they you know, they want a silver screw. They want to be able to uh, come up with an ad that's going to double, triple. Yeah. Uh, they want a know. quick fix. Exactly, quick fix. And uh, you know, you can get things done sooner than later, but you've got to get the foundation right. Yeah. So, uh, I, I'm going to talk at some point about what I call my four horsemen, Vigory's four horsemen. Yeah. Talk you, about it now. I'm going to hit record. Just talk about the foundation, and I'll do the intro in a second. But talk about the foundation, the four horsemen, and uh, just yeah, talk about those two things. All right, good. Yeah, go. Just hop right into it. Go All ahead. Right. Uh, well, I uh, have developed something that we call here at our company, uh, Vigory's Four Horsemen. Yeah. And uh, you've got to get these four things right. And if you do, life is downhill with the wind to your back, pretty easy. Get them wrong, you're going uphill with the wind in your face. You're not likely to succeed. Right. And I'll explain each one of these. Yeah. But first, maybe I should make people wait till the end to find them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> in true direct, you got to call now to get these four horsemen. All right, that, that, <laughs> no, certainly, but they, they uh, you're not going to succeed at most anything you do without understanding these four horsemen. Uh, and if you're young and single and you're looking for a spouse, you've got to do these four horsemen. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, right, right. you got to get these four things right. And if you do, uh, life will work for you. Okay. So tell me, go ahead. What are the four horsemen? Four horsemen, and I'll explain each one. First is position. Second is differentiation. Third is uh, USP, unique selling proposition, slash benefit. And the fourth is brand. Mm -hmm. uh, position is nothing more than a hole, H-O-L-E, in the marketplace. What hole in the marketplace does your company, your product, uh, you know, occupy? And that's something you do kind of privately. You decide what your hole is. And then you differentiate to the public out there. I like to use the example of, say, Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes. Twenty years ago, they want to start a cable television network. Well, they don't try to go out there and duplicate what CNN is doing or ABC, NBC, CBS. They say there's a hole in the marketplace. Nobody is serving the right of center marketplace. When you do that, boy, life gets pretty easy. So then they publicly differentiate themselves from the competition with hiring people like Bill O'Reilly, Glenn Beck for a while, Sean Hannity, Megyn Kelly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how they differentiate from the competition. Then the benefit is obvious, okay? The benefit is, uh, you know, you get news information you don't get anywhere else on, on television. Then... The brand is huge. It is nothing more than a combination of those other three, and it's what makes you singular, what makes you different, and uh, it what makes you Seth Godin's purple cow. Right, right. You know, I live out in a country with regularly past fields of 40 <laughs> black cows here, 50 brown and white ones there. One of those is that, that purple cow. Wow. So all of our goal in life is to be a purple cow. Mm. And by the way, brand, I can't tell you how important that is. And... When you go into the supermarket, there's nobody selling you, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, soap rather than the other soap. Or no, no, uh, Mr. Vigory, uh, this paper towel is better. The selling has been done before you walk in the store with the branding, okay? And so that's our goal is to brand ourselves, and the selling uh, is, you know, is very easy after that. Yeah, I had to have you go into that without waiting, but I'm going to formally introduce you. And so today we have Richard Vigory, who's one of the legends. If you haven't noticed from what he's already said, he's one of the legends of direct response marketing. Richard has transformed American politics in the 1960s and 70s by pioneering the use of direct mail fundraising. He has been dubbed the funding father of the conservative movement, and he has motivated millions of Americans to participate in politics. He's founded American Target Advertising in 1965 that helps multiply donor bases, and they've raised over $7 billion for their clients with time-tested direct response marketing. He's also the current chairman and founder of conservativehq.com. Richard, or Mr. Vigory, thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you, uh, Mr. Vigory passed away about okay. four years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, please, uh, Jeremy, uh, let me just say, add to that, 
uh, introduction. Yeah. Uh, appreciate that very much. I'm 81 years old. Just turned 81 a few weeks ago. Look young. I literally, I literally go 12 to 14 hours, five and a half days a week. And, you know, a few people can do that, but I don't know anyone that does that plus enjoys every minute of what they do. And I've been very blessed uh, to identify my unique ability, and I'm very focused on my unique ability. And I uh, enjoy 12, 14 hours a day uh, and don't know the name of anybody that uh, that can keep up with me. And by the way, uh, I jokingly refer to myself, uh, Jeremy, as uh, uh, 003, which means I've been active at the national level of the conservative movement longer than every living conservative except uh, two others. The 002 is Dr. Lee Edwards of the Heritage Foundation, a senior fellow there. And if you want, we can hold 001 identity until the end. Uh, yeah, let's, let's see. Let people try to figure out who is 001. Who's been active in the conservative movement longer than every living conservative? All right, I'm going to make a note of that. And so what is your unique ability? My uh, unique ability, uh, by the way, uh, I'm a big fan of Dan Sullivan and Strategic Coach. And I uh, discovered Dan about 14 years ago and uh, changed changed my life. And the, when I first went to Strategic Coach, uh, I, di- I now have Dan as my coach, but I didn't have uh, then. I had a woman named uh, 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 Reggie. Gosh, can we edit this out? No, just we'll, we'll uh, yeah. keep it rolling. I always do no no editing. All right. Uh, Anyway, uh, my coach uh, said, uh, after my list of 17 unique abilities, said, Richard, no, no, you're not understanding what 17 uh, unique abilities are. I mean, what's your unique ability? So you don't have 17. Uh, So I spent another hour, and I wintered it down to 14. And her exact words were, Richard, you're not listening (laughs) to me. (laughs) In other words, if I got 14 unique abilities, what is everybody else in the company doing? I've got everybody's job. So my unique ability is understanding marketing, writing. Uh, The company was built on my ability to write, cause a person who's moving in one direction to stop and move in a di- different direction, write out a check, uh, make a purchase, uh, that type of thing there. And working with uh, with clients. Uh, I enjoy working with clients, and uh, I guess maybe I'm a rainmaker, bring clients in uh, because of my brand and, uh, and 50 years experience plus. Uh, people, you know, uh, uh, want to be associated with our company, and uh, we've had a lot of successes over the years, and so that attracts people, and so that's what I focus on. I've got we have 80 employees, uh, and I've got a world-class team here of, of people. We're larger than all of our competitors uh, combined, and uh, we, uh, as Reagan said, you ain't seen nothing yet, and we plan to double or triple the size of our company in the coming uh, in the next two years here. Fantastic. By the way, I say uh, what we do is mostly conservative, right of center of marketing, and I say to conservative organizations, leaders, that uh, – uh, the next two years is going to be the best uh, opportunity to double, triple, quadruple the size of the organization that you're heading or involved in in my lifetime. Uh, conservatives, uh, grassroots right now, are frightened, angry, concerned, uh, and the next two years I think will be an enormous opportunity to grow conservative right-of-center organizations. Yeah, and, and Richard, I want to ask about the the foundation that you mentioned the top and explaining what that means for you know a group that what to how to get that foundation right but i have to ask first what are your secrets or tricks to staying so young vibrant healthy at 81 you know what uh, do you do on a daily basis what should we be doing well jeremy i uh uh, I wrote a book, uh, uh, two books in the last year. One political, which I do. The periodic. takeover, yeah. Uh, takeover, yeah. And, and deals with the 102-year-old war for the heart and soul of the Republican Party. The other book was a health book, uh, literally titled "How Conservatives Can Outlive Liberals," and <laughs> published about 400 copies uh, for my birth, 80th birthday last year. Uh, but it's going to come out in the bookstores. Uh, I'm like, I didn't see that one in my research. Beg pardon? I didn't see that one in my research. No, it hasn't uh, oh, yeah. seen the light of day yet, but it but it will next year. Uh, you know, my wife and I of uh, my wife and I of fifty two years. Uh, Congratulations! 
health nuts enthusiasts all of our life. Uh, and we had an experience early in our life where doctors couldn't uh, solve a problem that one of our daughters had. Hmm. And my wife uh, picked up a book by Adele Davis, who was the guru of nutrition, alternative medicine back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and discovered a way to cure our daughter's problem, uh, 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 shortage of vitamin A causes boils. So at that moment, we decided to take charge of our, our health. You know, yeah. the president, Obama, is not in charge of our health. Our doctor's not in charge. You know, nobody else. It's us. Yeah. And it's made a huge difference in our life. And so uh, uh, the, the uh, answer to your question as much as anything else, uh, Jeremy, as to why I'm able to do what I'm able to do here. Yes, it's good health, good genes, etc. But I have a goal. I have a vision. Yeah. It didn't happen today. But I promise you, tomorrow, before the sun sets, I will save Western civilization. <laughs> That's how I approach every single uh, you know day, and I'm just uh, consumed with a vision, a goal. I've, I've got. I hate to go to bed at night. Can't wait to get up in the morning, mm -hmm. and just uh, I've got a vision and a goal. And uh, if uh, you know the idea of retiring is just a strange foreign idea to me. You know, I'm at the top of my game. I'm better than I've ever been. I'm better now than I was five, 10, 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that you've got to continue to do until 81 what you've always done. But, you know, do something. Make a difference in, mm -hmm. in, in, in this world out there. Yeah. You can mentor people. You can, uh, you know, get involved in nonprofits. There's many, many things that you can do. And the idea of just working on your shuffleboard game or, you know, playing cards all day long is uh, I don't think that uh, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. Uh, our yeah, I mean, you obviously have a huge grand vision that propels you forward, but you still have to have the energy to move you forward, what do you do for your health on a daily, weekly basis that if you found works the best over the years? Well, I, uh, uh, I'm very uh, health conscious in terms of my diet. I uh, eat 10, 11 servings of fruit or vegetables a day. Uh, I was telling this to 20, 30 years ago to some employees I took to lunch and I had to be looking at one of the women while I was saying this and after I could see her processing that information for four or five seconds and after I told her I'd eat 10, 11 servings of food and vegetables of the day, she said, wow, you must be very regular. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will be very regular. <laughs> uh, but uh, the uh, you want to eat most vegetables raw, uh, mostly dark skin uh, fruits uh, and uh, the, I eat very little meat, uh, maybe two, three times a month. Usually it's when it's put in front of yeah. me at dinner, a banquet or something like that. Uh, a lot of seafood uh, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of liquids. Uh, I uh, and but, you know, nutrition and health is a big part of it. But it's so many other things. Uh, yeah. A sense of generosity. Be be uh, be generous out there with your time, your treasure. Uh, have a sense of gratitude. It's very very important to be thankful and appreciative of what you do have. Uh, I am involved in half a dozen communities. Uh, yeah. Almost every day, I'm involved in a community. Uh, I belong to you know numerous ones. And uh, hermits don't live as long as people who uh, you know are involved in life. So it has many many things. And hopefully, the book will be out next year, and uh, we'll be able to share it with All right. you. That sounds good. And so, Richard, how does being married for 52 years to the same person have uh, have a role in your health? In life. Oh, I think that's an important part of, of life. Married people live longer than single people, quite frankly. Uh, and uh, my wife has her unique ability. And, uh, you know, uh, she uh, uh, relies on me for a lot of political, ideological uh, information. And I rely on her uh, for things like nutrition, health, uh, things that uh, our family should be doing. And so it's been a, a wonderful partnership. Yeah. And it's so, so important. Uh, I wouldn't probably be, you know, have accomplished a fraction of what I have accomplished without my wife as my partner. So I highly recommend uh, <laughs> not married, get married and stay married <laughs> it's all the difference in the world people all frequently ask me by the way uh jeremy how many children or how many grandchildren i have mm -hmm. and i say i've got two answers one not enough <laughs> and three children and six grandchildren so uh that's great you know, 
anyway, I uh, enjoy life and, uh, you know, li life can be, uh, you know, exciting and, and doesn't happen accidentally. You've got to plan for it. And by the way, it's another thing that I believe in is, is planning. I plan so much about life. Uh, I've got something I call a four part plan. Many ways to do a plan, um, Jeremy. But uh, we used to get off as conservatives back in the late 70s, early 80s, 2025 of us, we'd plan, plan on a Friday, Saturday. And it was a young congressman from uh, uh, Georgia. Newt Gingrich. Whenever we'd come up with a problem, he'd go to the blackboard. We didn't have whiteboards in those days and write four words on there. Vision, goal, strategy, and tactics and uh, or projects. And an hour later, we'd filled in vision, goal, strategy, and what's our tactics or projects. And we saw a path forward. And I just recommend that for anything that you're doing. For Before I wrote uh, my two books, I did a four-part plan. It was my vision, goal, strategy, tactics, mm -hmm projects for the uh, the book and then after i wrote the book then i said what's my vision goal strategy tactics to market the book and yeah. so i break out most everything i do of any consequence break it out into those four part plans and then by the way the number one benefit of writing the plan is not working the plan that's important but that's secondary the number one benefit is writing the plan as you write the plan it crystallizes it clarifies your thinking you thought you wanted to go over here but you see when you write the plan no i need to go here a little more of this a little less of that so writing the plan is hugely important and it's permissible to change it regularly, but share it with others. Get other people in to buy into your plan. You want to uh, lose weight, you've got a plan, okay? Share it with others. It puts right. pressure on you. So you're at dinner, and uh, you pick up uh, <laughs> a piece of cake, and it, you know, you're know you less likely to pick up that piece of cake because you've shared your diet plan with others. So yeah, uh, write that plan, share it with others. So Richard, what what worked in your plan and what didn't work as well when you were going out to market uh, the your book uh, take uh, takeover? Well, uh, you know, I think it, it's uh, it's worked well. Uh, if there's uh, you know things that I uh, would like to have been done different, I'm not sure I could have. Uh, it's a time issue. Uh, I've got so many projects, you know, I'm helping to run an 80 person uh, <laughs> marketing company. I, uh, uh, very involved in the conservative movement nationally. I'm very focused these days on trying to get conservatives in the closing weeks of the campaign to nationalize the election. I've got my website, conservativehq.com, where I'm trying to provide leadership for the conservative movement. Uh, not only one, but two books last year. So I just, I spread yeah. myself, quite frankly, probably too thin, uh, but, uh, Unfortunately, this book takeover is going to have a long life, I say, unfortunately, yeah. because uh, conservatives uh, won't be taking over the Republican Party in the next day, week, month, and maybe in the next couple of years. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to continue to market uh, both my takeover book and my health book for, for years to come. What worked with the marketing for you, even with you being spread thin? Well, uh, one of the things that, that works is to uh, have a brand. Yeah. Uh, I ask you because I saw, I, was, I mean, it wasn't necessarily for a takeover, but I saw you on The Daily Show. You're on, like, you can Google your name and you come up across all this media. You're speaking in, in big media. So I'm wondering what, uh, what's worked and what, you know, for, for that book or any other books. Well, you know, one of the things uh, I was fortunate to do uh, many years ago, um, I think you referenced it in the introduction, that I pioneered political ideological direct mail. So that's my hole in the marketplace. No matter what happens to me in life, you know, nobody can ever take that away. I pioneered political ideological direct mail. So mm -hmm. I was the first. Uh, and so those in the audience, uh, you know, listening to us now, what is it you can be first in? What, what category can you own? Uh, and by the way, at 80, age 81, uh, Jeremy, I spend two and a half to three hours every day, six days a week, studying marketing. Hmm. Uh, I don't have to do that, but that's why I think I uh, uh, am where I am, because I study, study, study. And uh, I don't read everything out there on marketing, but there's uh, maybe a dozen authors out there hmm. that I think, uh, you know, uh, you should really, really uh, study. There's a few of them out there, like... Uh, Seth Godin and Al Reese and Jack Trout that I say to my uh, team here, don't read, memorize them. <laughs> you know, whatever Seth Godin, Al Reese and Jack Trout haven't written about marketing, 
may not be worth knowing. Uh, and I reread those uh, authors over and over and over. And I underline parts, and I can go through uh, one of their books in 20, 30 minutes because I've underlined the important things. I do that every, every few months or so. Uh, so uh, that is hugely important to, uh, to study, study marketing. Yeah. And Richard, you said at the top of the interview, most people get wrong the, or they don't focus, they want that silver bullet and they don't focus on the foundation. Can you just tell us a little bit about the foundation people should be starting with and, and how to start it? Well, uh, you, you start with, uh, you know, really, if you, if you don't want to spend your time uh, focusing on marketing, that's fine, but make sure somebody in your organization really has. And I go back to what I said earlier. Uh, analyze uh, your project and, and break it down to those four parts, which your vision, goals, strategy, tactics. Then you do the four horsemen. Uh, and, you know, you can build a 10, 20, 30, 50 story building, but you got to have the foundation right. OK, and the foundation is hugely important. And you've got to if you don't know if you don't know where you're going very clearly, uh, you know, any train will get you there, as the old saying goes. Right. And a lot of times people get confused about a plan. They think a plan is, uh, you know, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. That's not a plan. That's a wish. That's a dream and aspiration. And, and that's fine. But it's not a plan. Uh, the plan is very, very specific. Uh, I'm going to uh, go to college. I'm going to major in this. I'm going to get a job doing this. I'm going to save this amount of money, uh, et cetera. So uh, a plan is very different than, than wishes and, and goals. And, uh, you know, there's no shortage of money out there, uh, Jeremy. The shortage of, of ideas. Uh, and so there's lots of money to be made. I remember in the late 40s hearing my dad and some men in the neighborhood talking about too bad I didn't do this or buy this, uh, that, you know, because most of all the money's been made now. This is in the late 40s, you know, <laughs> and, and we know, uh, of course, uh, they didn't have the, the vision. Uh, and they're just, uh, you know, uh, my, the Bible tells us my people perish without a vision. So uh, get that vision and do the fundamentals right and life will be very successful for you probably. So Richard, I want to know what, what was a big influence for you growing up? Uh, I uh, just came into this world consumed with trying to help my brothers and sisters. Uh, and when I'm a, a teenager uh, growing up outside of Houston in uh, the, uh, the 1940s, uh, uh, I'm kids in the neighborhood. We're playing cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians. I don't tell anybody, but I'm not shooting robbers. I'm not shooting the Indians, you know. Uh, I'm shooting communists because I came to this world knowing communists are bad people. And so I was just always consumed with trying to change the world. And then as I got older and more knowledgeable, I, you know, broadened it to uh, a uh, conservative free market uh, idea, traditional moral values. Values and I have, uh, you know, a very clearly defined, well thought out, well studied, well researched uh, worldview, and uh, that motivates me. I mean, as I said earlier, I hate to go to bed at night, can't wait to get up in the morning, because I've got a, a vision, I've got a goal, and I'm trying to achieve that, and it just motivates me uh, in a massive way. Who was a big influence for you growing up? Well, uh, you know, I. Uh, I studied uh, growing up, uh, you know, people like uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur, and uh, as an anti-communist, I was focused on uh, conserv uh, anti-communist leaders like uh, Senator Joe McCarthy, uh, uh, others, and as I, uh, you know, uh, got more, uh, you know, got older, I began to uh, look to uh, religious leaders, you know, uh, uh, Bishop Fulton J. Sheen and, and others out there, and my faith is very important to me. I grew up as a as a cradle Catholic, and to this day, the most important issues to me are the the moral issues, and I think, all uh, right, the the fundamental uh, reason why we have most all problems in the world is that we've gotten away from uh, traditional uh, moral values, in in my opinion. So uh, when I uh, in 1961, Jeremy, I had the chance to go to New York to become executive secretary of a local youth organization that had just been founded uh, months earlier on Bill Buckley's family estate. It was called Young Americans for Freedom. And so when I went to Young Americans for Freedom, uh, they had a big name, but very little uh, members, uh, very little, uh, uh, in fact, they had a debt. 
And so my uh, boss, I worked for an advertising agency that, that had the YAF account, and he gave me the names of three uh, well-known people to call and ask for money. Uh, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, a World War I hero and uh, uh, founder of Eastern Airlines, J. Howard Pugh of Sun Oil Company, and Charles Edison, the youngest son of the inventor. And I called on all of them. They were generous, gave me money, but I realized real quick, like, I didn't like asking people for money, uh, even though I'd been successful. Uh, so I started writing writing letters and that seemed to work so I hired another secretary or two that worked got a mimeograph machine that's what we had in those days mimeograph machines and uh, after about a year and a half of doing that I said to the, the people who run the organization the board of directors I'd like to be relieved of all duties except direct mail let me focus on direct mail and I did that for another year and a half and after that I said okay I know everything there ever is to know about direct mail <laughs> I've been doing it three three and a half years but <laughs> Two babies. Of course, I knew nothing. <laughs> and, uh, Who else was doing direct time. mail at the time? Beg your pardon? Who else was doing direct mail at the time? Were you learning from anyone, or was this uh, just you were just going as you? Very good question, uh, Jeremy. Uh, to this day, I say that I've learned 90, 95% of what I know about uh, direct mail, direct marketing from the commercial world. I've learned a relative little bit from the, uh, uh, the nonprofit community. Uh, I began to study uh, David Ogilvy uh, and uh, the giants like uh, Ed Mayer and Dick Benson and, and others out there, uh, Leo Burnett. And so I just, uh, you know, devoured whatever they had, had written. And uh, to this day, I feel that there's very little uh, professionalism in nonprofit community. And that's on the left, it's on the right, in the center, in the charitable community. I say not all of them, obviously, some very good high level professionals in nonprofit marketing. But most people in nonprofit marketing have read a few books, been to a few conferences, and kind of learned it by, you know, their gut, the seat of the pants. And I say that most people in nonprofit marketing are blind in one eye, have blurred vision in the other. But since everybody else is blind in marketing, they look pretty good. <laughs> so study heavily the, uh, the people in the commercial world. Uh, one of the things I'm a big advocate of, Jeremy, is uh, we all need teachers. We all need mentors. I was very blessed in my life to have three giants, uh, a fellow named Marvin Liebman, who uh, was my first employer in uh, the conservative community uh, with a major uh, uh, fundraiser for conservative anti-communist causes back in the in the 1960s and then uh, in the mid 1960s I was introduced to Ed Mayer and Ed uh, had been very successful in commercial direct mail and was a primary uh, educator teacher for the direct marketing association uh, and so he and I just had a hit it off real quick like in 1965 and for the next 12 years he came to my office once a month sat at my conference room table that I still have and uh, and met with me and my team and reviewed our packages in direct mail once a month. That was 12 years. He died around 1977. Mm. A few weeks later, I got a phone call from a man who said, your, your mentor, your guru just died. Can I be your new mentor? Wow. And I said, You've got the job. And that was Dick Benson. And so I went from one giant to the next giant. And uh, it made all the difference in the world to be mentored by, by people like Ed Mayer and, uh, and Dick Benson and, and Marvin Liebman. So I encourage everybody out there, whether you're in nonprofit marketing, commercial marketing, find somebody who's uh, experienced, very knowledgeable in marketing, and be mentored by them. And we, we all need uh, coaches. So what did Dick Benson teach you? Oh, Dick Benson, where can, should I start? He was he was a great man. Uh, he uh, had, as did Ed Mayer, too. Both of them had a reputation of being kind of rough and gruff and, uh, you know, take no prisoners and all that. They were pussycats. They were just, <laughs> got to know them. They were just a salt of the earth, wonderful human beings. Uh, but you had to get by that first veneer of, of roughness there. And once you did, you know, they just uh, they were exceedingly generous with their, their knowledge and their time, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and you know, with uh, Dick uh, came from the commercial world. 
and uh, and he had limited experience in the nonprofit world, and I was fortunate to be able to share things with him from the nonprofit world. But uh, he uh, he taught me so much. Uh, one of the uh, things that very few people in the nonprofit community know, Dick Benson know, knew and stressed, was the lifetime value of a customer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many people don't understand the importance of that. That drives and dictates how much money you can spend on advertising. Uh, and some people want to uh, make a, a profit on the first uh, advertisement they do. Uh, and uh, that may be uh, valuable and may be accurate for the business you're in, but chances are it's not. For the vast majority of people in the commercial or nonprofit world, um, you want to invest in the acquisition of a customer, the acquisition of, of a donor, and you need to know the lifetime value or come as close as you can. And then that dictates how much you can spend to uh, uh, you know, to acquire that, that customer, that donor. And, and by the way, as people, Jeremy, are building their uh, their uh, their brand uh, and uh, you you don't do that quite frankly with advertising. I would strongly caution people to minimize their advertising dollars, spend it on buzz. Uh, buzz is when other people spend their money promoting you. Advertising is when you spend your own money promoting you, and uh, you you advertise to protect your brand. But uh, you build your brand brand 99% of the time with buzz, you know, articles in newspapers, people talking about you on the radio, word of mouth, the, uh, the internet, etc. So do those things that will cause people to uh, promote and talk uh, about you. And then once you've got an established brand, then uh, spend money to advertise to protect your share of market. Yeah. So Richard, what was it about you where Dick Benson called you to ask to mentor you, because that's pre- that's not a common place. Some people just do anything in their power to get in front of that mentor, but this person was calling you. Well, you know, I uh, I like people, and uh, and I like uh, you know to. Uh, get to know people, and I got to know Dick uh, before he made that phone call mm-hmm. on a personal basis. We would see mm-hmm. each other at conferences, and I always wanted to know about his wife and children. And I was genuinely interested, uh, you know, in Ed Mayer and uh, as well as Dick Benson. And so we had a, a personal relationship there. Also, uh, I had a hole in the marketplace, which was I was involved uh, at the top level of marketing for conservative anti-communist causes. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are uh, focused on their business, but they really are interested in politics. They're interested in public policy. Yeah. And uh, probably Dick didn't know anybody operating at the, you know, at the national level, as I was, uh, that was interested in, involved in concerted politics. So there was a an attraction there. Uh, while, you know, he could teach me a great deal about uh, marketing, particularly commercial marketing, you know, I was able to inform him and enlighten him about politics in a way that was interesting interesting because I was regularly meeting with, you know, the president of the United States or senators or governors or politicians. And that was of interest to people like Ed Mayer. And, and you know, and, and they knew what I was involved in in my company. And they uh, felt, quite frankly, satisfaction by being able to be of help uh, to advance that cause. They shared my views and values. And uh, and they appreciated the fact that I would, uh, you know, take the information that they were sharing with me and advance the causes that we both shared. So were you meeting with the presidents? Well, not a lot, to uh, be honest with you. But, uh, you know, under uh, Reagan's, you know, presidency, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, Reagan uh, uh, walked with conservatives. Uh, and uh, I'd regularly uh, tell people or people tell me, why don't you think this politician is a conservative, Richard, or that politician? I say, tell me who you walk with and I tell you who you are. Uh, a lot of these national politicians uh, don't walk with conservatives. Ronald Reagan walked with us. Uh, you know, regularly we would, I'd be in the 1970s, uh, in the late 60s, uh, I would be at receptions or dinners and talking to a friend and I'd turn to my right or left. Oh, nice to see you Gov- again, Governor Reagan. You know, he's there. He was not just at the head table. He came to our meetings. He walked with us. He would, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just interact with us. So uh, not as often as I would like, but uh, but we did see him uh, regularly. And he was uh, he, he, he came from uh, the ranks of the conservatives, unlike a lot of these national Republican leaders now who, who would, wouldn't know most conservative leaders. So, Richard, tell me 
at that point, when you went to that person at the company and said, I only want to do direct mail, what was ne- what was the next big turning point in your career? Uh, shortly after I did that, uh, I had a huge breakthrough. Uh, this is now, uh, I, in the summer of 63, I asked to be relieved of all duties except direct mail. Right. And sometime shortly thereafter, probably earlier, maybe or sometime in 1964, this is, of course, uh, Goldwater's running for president, a lot of uh, conservative activity and energy around that. In fact, that almost dominated conservative politics, Goldwater, uh, the draft Goldwater effort in 1962-63, and then an actual run for the presidency in 64. Then I discovered, Jeremy, that uh, if you're running for president, you had to file with the clerk of the U.S. House of Representatives a list of all your $50 donors. Uh, so I went down there one day and saw, yeah, the big stack of people who had given $50 or more to Barry Goldwater's campaign. So the next day I came back with a legal pad. I started writing on it. Came back the second day, wrote more names. And then I kind of stood back a little bit and said, hey, you know, there's a lot of names here. I'm not making progress. <laughs> so I hired about six women to come there for about six weeks and copy these names and addresses. And they got about 12,500. And uh, that uh, was the beginning of our mailing list. Now it's in excess of 10 million wow. uh, donors to conservative right of center uh, causes. Then I thought, well, if they have to do that at the national level, maybe they also have to do that in Austin, Texas, or Sacramento, California, or Albany, New York. And I did. Sure enough, they did. So I got on my pony, so to speak, and went to these state capitals. And I had a little fax machine. But in those days, it was a liquid process. So I had bags of fluid, you know, that would put the paper wow. in, come out wet, had to set it over to dry for a while. And anyway, I did that uh, throughout the year, 1965, because I started my company in January of 65. And by the end of the year, I'd acquired about 100,000 uh, donor names. And that was the basis of me being able to to quit a good job, even though I had a wife and two babies in and and go out and go where no one had ever gone before no one had ever done uh commercially or, or uh, a for-profit organization raise money through small donors people who would give 10 15 25 50 100 dollars before fundraising was always you know the proverbial smoke-filled back rooms where people would give large sums of money and uh that uh began to uh, revolutionize american politics and by the way Jeremy. I started my company in 1965, and for 15 years, uh, I had no competition, in, in essence. Uh, wow, and 15 fact, years. Throughout, throughout the 1970s, I caught a lot of criticism, because uh, I was doing something unheard of. Uh, I'd regularly be attacked on NBC, ABC, CBS, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Time Magazine, uh, but all of that criticism stopped within a few hours. In a few hours was election night, November 1980, when collectively you could hear the media and the political community say, aha, that's what Vigory has been up to. And so the left, uh, who had relied mostly on union dues and government money and foundations to support their causes, ran out there to try to do what I had been doing for the conservatives. But I told my conservative friends, well, don't worry, don't bother, you know, don't be concerned about that, because it took me 15 or more years to do this. Right. Uh, and I'm smarter than the left is, of course, you know, it's going to take them 20, 25 years. Not so. <laughs> Within, in my opinion, uh, three years, four years, the left had caught up with the conservatives. And to this day, in my opinion, the left does a significantly better job of direct marketing than the conservatives do. Uh, just look at the Obama campaign. In 2008, they had 13 million email addresses. 10 million were supporters, people on their email list, 3 million donors. Republicans don't have anything to touch that. McCain didn't, couldn't come close to that, nor could uh, Romney in uh, 2012. So uh, if you can, uh, own a category, you know, pioneer an area and try to make, you know, can you, uh, uh, Jack Reese and Al Reese, uh, their great book, uh, 21 Immutable Le- uh, Laws of Marketing, talked about being first. Can you be the first, uh, say, beer? No. Can you be the first imported beer? No. Can you be the first imported beer from Sweden? How about the first imported light beer from Sweden? That type of thing. So own a category. Once you own a category, no matter how small it is, you can make it into a very big category. Yeah. So, Richard, tell me, you had these 100,000 names. What did you do next? Uh then uh, I uh, began to uh, go to uh, 
conservative organizations and you know tried to get them to uh, do uh, uh, direct mail fundraising. It just again hadn't been done before, and I found it very difficult uh, uh, to convince many people to do it because this was brand new. Nobody had ever done this before. We're, and uh, one way I was able to do that was to say, uh, let me uh, do some test mailings. And I'll tell you what, I'll put up the money. I'll finance the mailing, including postage, printing, etc. cetera. Uh, and if the money comes in, pay our bills. And if it doesn't, you don't owe us anything. Uh, and I learned early on, God in his infinite wisdom seldom saw fit to put in one body a nonprofit person and an entrepreneur. By definition, an entrepreneur is a risk taker. Right. That's and a big so, bet to tell someone that you're, you're putting up all the, the money and all the work. Absolutely. And uh, again, you know, I don't have uh, hardly any nickels to spare. Your wife going to kill you? You have two babies? What? Well, uh, if, she, if she'd have known it, she probably <laughs> have to, you know, But I didn't quite frankly share everything with her. She made me very nervous, but but you're right. But I, uh, I rolled the dice every day. I would get up. But uh, I really, really studied and I, I had confidence in myself. And let's say I had a client and I needed $20,000 to come in from this mailing. I would write a letter and uh, Phil, at the end of the letter, I said, well, this is a good letter, but it's only going to raise $10,000. I'd literally tear it up, start again, write it again. Well, now I'm up to 15000 That's not good enough. I need 20000 How did you know that? Uh, I just had that ability, I think, yeah. to really understand uh, how successful it would be. And uh, I just had that you know, gut and, and educated intelligence to be able to say, this will work, this won't work. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to what I thought was a $20,000 letter, uh, then I would go and mail. And uh, it, it worked. Uh, and I say to even my, my I've got world class marketers working for me out of our 80 employees. And I tell them uh, every day or regularly that as good as you are, you're going to be tough to uh, to to uh, be as good as I am because I had an advantage over you, uh, and the advantage is uh, similar to every day, Jeremy. There are millions and millions of races between foxes and rabbits, and I ask my people, it says, uh, "Who wins most of those races?" And and the most of the races are won by rabbits. Uh, and but foxes win some of them because there are foxes out there. They get to eat the rabbits now and then. But the reason that win rabbits win most of the races, is the rabbit is running for supper. I mean, it's good. Running for, for his life. life. Yeah, yeah. Fox is running for supper. Okay. When I was writing that copy, I was writing for my life. You yeah, know, yeah, if yeah. I had one bad letter, I lost twenty thousand dollars. I'm out of business, okay? So I was running for my life, okay? And I developed my skills with that type of pressure. Uh, and these people who work for me and work for other agencies, they will never experience that type of pressure. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, are a freelance writer, it's not your money you're putting up. But back in the 60s and the 70s, I am writing the copy and putting up my own letter. And I had to, I mean, it, I was Good to eat, yeah, right? and feed your yeah. kids. Yeah, exactly. And so it puts pressure on you that uh, few people will really have. So, Richard, what was the difference between that $20,000 letter and the $10,000 letter? Do you remember? Uh, the uh, Often the, t the, the difference was uh, a mistake that I regularly see in nonprofit marketing on the left and the right. And that is that the... Uh, most nonprofit uh, mailings, including uh, charitable, health and welfare, they are cussing the problem. They're telling how bad cancer is, how bad this problem is, that problem, uh, and how bad you know, conservatives will say how bad liberals are, liberals will say how bad conservatives are. But I know that. You know, if, if I'm tempted to give, if I'm on the mailing list, you're right. I'm I know speaking that. to the choir, yeah. Yeah, but what are you going to do to solve the problem? What are you going to do with my $25, you know? And you have to come up with a real solid plan, not a wish or a goal or dream. So you got to have specifics. What are you going to do with my $25? What's the benefit? Again, you go, so you're in the commercial world. And my four horsemen, position, differentiation, benefit, bread. So I give you $25, $100 for this product. What's the benefit that I get? How's my life going to be better improved etc if i buy your product so those four horsemen are hugely important to to any uh buddy in uh in business uh whether it's nonprofit or commercial so what were some of the examples of the benefits that you put in that letter 
Well, uh, we would talk about uh, maybe passage of legislation or maybe defeat legislation. Uh, and uh, if we're raising money for a candidate, uh, we wouldn't just say we need money, $100,000, you know, but we need money to uh, put a billboard that costs $100 on the corner of Maine and Elm. You know, will you give that hundred dollars there? And uh, our uh, uh, a radio ad cost uh, you know fifteen dollars for uh, for a thirty second ad, and we want to uh, you know put this ad. We show them a copy of the ad or the television ad. So very very specific uh, examples. And uh, and then you know who would sign the letter is very hugely important. What are your credentials? I regularly still this day get mail from people I've never heard of, and I know most everybody in the National Conservative Movement, and I've never heard of this organization, never heard of the letter signer, never heard of, of their you know their cause or whatever. And uh, it's going to be difficult to raise money if you uh, you know don't uh, really put yourself in the. Uh, in, in the uh, customer's uh, uh, shoes. And it's one of the things that I'm just really big on is being donor-centric, customer-centric. Uh, and one of the reasons I think, Jeremy, I was successful back in the 60s and the 70s is that I am what is known as maybe as a true believer. I am one with my audience. Bill Buckley famously said years and years ago that he was a conservative, but he was not of the breed. On Saturday night, he wants to hang out with Truman Capote, not with, with, with grassroots conservatives, maybe. Uh, not me. I am one with the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the audience out there. I'm one with my audience. Uh, I'm, I can go to the, uh, in, uh, any conservative meeting or rally, sit on the front row. I don't have to look and see when everybody else is standing up to applaud. I know when to stand up. I know when to sit down. I'm a Catholic, and uh, I pray I'm a Catholic. Anyway. I can sit in the front row. I know when to stand. I know when to sit. I know when to genuflect, <laughs> you know, <laughs> etc. And so being one with my audience was hugely important because yeah. I, I read what they read. I went to the meetings that they went to. I talked to them. And so I just became one with them. And so when you're selling a product, you know, know your audience, you know, the uh uh, if I've never heard that the marketing uh, industry had a, uh, uh, a theme song, so to speak, but I've often thought that if they ever wanted a song to kind of symbolize direct marketing, it would be the opening song in the, the wonderful movie, The Sound of Music. And they're, they're on a train, the always traveling salesman, and they're singing the song, you got to know the territory, you got to know the territory. So you know the territory, you know your customers, you, uh, you know your audience, you know, it makes a huge difference yeah so richard what was one of the most successful direct mail campaigns that you can walk us through possibly and why it was effective well uh let me give you uh one example um in 1975 the right to work committee uh concerned with the unionization of uh of uh, uh of the country particularly the uh the the public sector uh, there, a big issue in those days was a legislation called common situs and Jerry Ford in 1975 was president and he had promised his secretary of labor as well as uh, George Meany, head of the AFL-CIO, put common situs legislation on my desk and I'll sign it. Common situs legislation is legislation that if on a, say a construction site, you've got a dozen unions. If one of those unions goes on strike, the pipe fitters, everybody walks off the job. And uh, that's illegal now. Uh, but uh, they wanted that legislation. So uh, they uh, engaged us to mail four million uh, letters. And you can mail letters in those days, including postage, for 25 cents. So we mailed four million at wow. a cost of a million dollars. Okay, and uh, and Ford had promised to sign that legislation. Well, the Congress passed the legislation and put it on his desk, and he vetoed the legislation because a friend of mine working in the press office uh, said that uh, Ford got on his desk 720,000 cards and letters as a result of, of our mailings. Wow. So. The mailing cost a million dollars, but it brought in seven hundred thousand dollars, and that's part of that criticism I said I got back in. Yeah, the I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Uh, so people say, well, Vigory spent a million dollars and uh, lost three hundred thousand dollars on the mailing. Well, the purpose of the mailing was not to raise money. The purpose of the mailing was to defeat the legislation. One, it had that effect. Okay. Two. 90,000 people, Jeremy, gave to that uh, mailing that had never given to the Right to Work Committee before. So, 
everybody, including me, is going to go to our grave never knowing how much more money those 90,000 people gave. But it was something, I'm convinced, north of $20 million. So, again, lifetime value of that. Mm-hmm. So they invested, you know, three hundred thousand dollars, got ninety thousand uh, dollars, ninety thousand new donors, and they gave twenty, thirty, or more million dollars over the next twenty-five, thirty years. Yeah. And by the way, Darren, uh, in nineteen sixty-one, when I start uh, with Young Americans of Freedom, direct mail was the second largest form of advertising in the country. In 2014, direct mail is the second largest form of advertising in the country. So that when you are mailing out there, uh, and maybe one, two, three percent are responding with a purchase a contribution, you are still uh, you're advertising, you're educating people, you're informing them, you're identifying future customers. You know, uh, so it uh, people think of it just as immediate sales or immediate uh, contribution, but it is advertising is just as much as if you bought time on uh, uh, CBS or uh, ad in Time Magazine, except there's a huge difference. You get a name and address back that can be a long time uh, customer Mm -hmm. that you don't get when you just advertise usually on radio or television. Richard, I love that story. Um, Do you have another good one for for a successful one? There's so many out there. Uh, The, uh, you know, I I would give kind of just the the bigger overview of, uh, of it, and it is this that uh, playing off what I was just saying, direct mail is advertising, okay? And uh, I uh, was uh, uh, asked to participate in a breakfast uh, by a man named Godfrey Spurling, who was a longtime senior Washington correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, the Monday after Reagan was elected president in uh, 1980. And he said uh, about 25 of the top print journalists in the country were at the breakfast. And he did this a couple of times a week. And I was his guest a number of times. But this particular time, he introduced me by uh, saying, Mr. Vigory, the Republicans last Tuesday scored a landslide victory for president. They uh, picked up control of the U.S. Senate, major gains in the House, governor gains, legislature. Except. How did all this happen? No one saw this coming. I said, excuse me, Mr. Spurting, you didn't see it coming. We did. I can't tell you how many press conferences we called where nobody came. You know, I mean, press releases we, we issued. Nobody uh, reported on our press releases. We were building a movement out there that y'all ignored. OK, but it was all under the radar. Again, direct mail is under the radar. Uh, when you advertise on radio, television, billboards, people see what you're doing. People don't know if you mailed six letters or six million letters. Right. Uh, so uh, direct mail can do great and wonderful things, but it is it can be expensive. Uh, so that's why you've got to study, study, study marketing. Yeah. And, uh, and there, there are giants out there, and there's 100 books on marketing, and that's fine. Uh, but you don't have time to read 100 books well. Read a dozen or so books. Uh, again, people books by Al Reese, Jack Trout. Uh, Dick Benson, uh, Seth Godin, uh, and a few other authors out there, and and study those people, and uh, and, and marketing will produce great and wonderful yeah. things. Yeah. So, Richard, I know in life and business, not everything works out. What was a direct mail campaign that didn't work, and why do you think? Oh gosh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I can. Uh, I mean, there, there's lots of them. Uh, the uh, I'm just trying to uh, to to think of uh, some now. Uh, I have had, uh, you know, uh, going back to uh, the Right to Work Committee. Okay, uh, I'll, uh, we were I'm talking about a campaign we conducted in 1975-76. The first campaign we did for the uh, the Right to Work Committee uh, was in. Uh, uh, 1969, uh, mailed 500,000 letters on December 7th, uh, right before Christmas. Not a good time. That's <laughs> uh, the mailing along with a, a partner. And uh, uh, December 19th, no letters. December 20th, no letters. December 21st, a few letters. By December 24th, you know, seven, eight, ten letters. Worst Christmas of my life. <laughs> okay. December uh, uh, 26th, uh, the floodgates opened and the postman came in trucks, <laughs> you know, and dumped the uh, the mail out there. So, uh, you know, that was, uh, again, a, a, a huge success. But uh, 
the uh, you do uh, have your head handed to you at uh, at times, uh, and that's why it's so important. That people in direct marketing constantly say, "Test, test, test." Right. And I invented something years ago called gut roll. You know, just kind of go with my gut. And I've I've had more than my share of successes of those, but sometimes uh, uh, we we have our head handed to us too. I remember in uh, uh, 1978 or so, I hired somebody from the commercial world, New York. And uh, I'm working at home, and I get my mail delivered to me from the office, and I saw that one of our clients had a big mailing. Uh, it was a uh, oh, 9 by 12 uh, inline package, uh, and I really blew my top. And I said, this is outrageous. Direct mail is nine by uh, uh, number ten letters. That's what direct mail is. Okay, not these nine by twelve grand big giant packages. And so I really was very you know a little tough on on the executive. Okay, and then a week or two later the money the mail bags were coming and it was just you know we were sp- spending a dollar bringing in three or four dollars for every letter. And I just said, well, obviously you made a mistake. You got <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you did something wrong. And of course, since then we've mailed I'm sure over a billion you know those big inline packages there so just test 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 and you never know uh and uh they're uh, you know and and there's an old saying in drawing steal smartly steal smartly i uh, i'm on you know i'm sure a hundred different direct mail lists that's one of the things that i urge your uh listeners to uh you know take a few hundred dollars and, and buy these products uh contribute to these organizations and get on lots of mailing lists and get other uh, lists and see what others are doing out there. Mm -hmm. So also, Richard, I wanted to ask of some of your favorite stories from your book. What's a favorite story that you have from TakeOver and a favorite story from America's Right Turn? Well, uh, talking about uh, failures, uh, I started life uh, politically uh, kind of... uh, Publicly in 1952, I was a Taft supporter. I mean, Taft was running against Eisenhower for the Republican nomination um, in Houston, Texas, and uh, so I'm a precinct chairman. 19, I can't vote though in, in, in uh, 1952 if you're uh, 19 years old, and uh, so uh, Amanda's precinct is uh, today probably 75 percent of the people in this area uh, vote Republican. In those days, very few did. <laughs> uh, and two people showed up for 12 hours from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. My mother and father, <laughs> <laughs> and that was my introduction to politics but it didn't did not uh, d- discourage me uh but uh i uh in terms of your question again was uh was, what are your favorite stories from oh, uh, or your favorite story from america's right turn and a favorite story from takeover okay uh the uh, uh let's see takeover you know i uh, uh gosh alive i'm not sure uh the uh uh you know, they, I would encourage people if you have any interest in politics to 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 buy the book because what I do in the book, uh, Jeremy, is to chronicle the last 102 years. It's literally a 102 year civil war started in uh, 1912. Teddy Roosevelt leads the Republican Party, uh, splits the Republican vote, runs for president on the Boo Moose Party, and Woodrow Wilson elected president with less than 42 percent of the vote. We've been uh, battling that wing of the party ever since. And for the most part, uh, people uh, who have my worldview have been losing. Uh, But I think that uh, uh, if we follow what uh, the plan I lay out in the book, that conservatives can literally take over the Republican Party in the next two years and be governing America by 2017. I paraphrase James Carville, who in 1992 said uh, ad nauseum to uh, Democrats, it's the economy stupid, it's the economy stupid. He wanted to drive that point home uh, for the Clinton team to focus on uh, the economy. So I uh, uh, paraphrase that and tell conservatives, it's the primary stupid, it's the primary stupid, because uh, uh, if all we uh, do is elect more big government establishment Republicans, uh, we'll have wasted the opportunity of a lifetime and we'll never govern America. And by the way, in my opinion, the American people don't like the big government Republicans. In 2006, the uh, Republicans lost the Congress 2008. They still lost the Congress and the White House again with 2012 being led by big government Republicans, Carl Rove, George Bush, uh, Denny Hastert, John McCain, Mitt Romney, etc. In 2010, they had the biggest vic- congressional victory in 75, 80 years. But those people I just named are nowhere to be seen. The people who are the 
face of the opposition is the Tea Party, Rush Limbaugh, Hannity, Levin, uh, you know, Mike Lee, Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, those type of people, and gave the public a big victory. So going forward, I think you're going to see in the next two years a huge battle uh, for uh, takeover, for, for the heart and soul of the Republican Party. And by the way, in my opinion, conservatives have had their political guns pointed at the wrong target, uh, and they've been focused on the Democrats. The number one problem for conservatives are uh, uh, inside the Republican Party, the big government Republicans. I say that conservatives are like the biblical Jews who had to wander through the desert for 40 years until that generation of failed, flawed leaders had passed from the scene. So conservatives are not going to get to the political promised land till we get new leaders. And they're on the horizon. I can see them now. I love it. I don't know how much how you store all that information in your brain, all those names. Uh, but what are some, Richard? What are some of the big mistakes people do make with their direct response marketing? Uh, gosh, it probably it's, uh, you know, we could talk the rest of the day on that. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite. I ask because you have you know if you, you run an eighty person company, so I'm sure you run a lot of campaigns. You you help a lot of you know, your staff and companies. I want to hear about some of the big mistakes. The uh, mistake that, you know, we make in our company, uh, but I'm constantly and my executive team is constantly working to uh, make sure we minimize this problem. And I suspect a lot of people listening to us now are making the same mistake. And that is uh, uh, silos. It's very easy in an organization to be, build silos. You've got your internet team over here, you've got your postal team over here, your finance team here, and your list people and all that. You know, you should constantly be about the business of knocking down silos and having a seamless organization so that everybody's part of marketing, everybody's involved in the same cause here, and it's very easy to have these silos built up. And, right. You know, and people say, well, I'm not part of the body, I'm the leg, you know, or I'm the arm or the ear, you know, and that's a huge problem. Another uh, uh, problem is uh, the Internet. And we all, you know, focused on the Internet these days. And by the way, if you're uh, indirect marketing, keep in mind. Those organizations, let's say particularly in the nonprofit area, in the nonprofit area, those organizations are cutting edge, doing the very, very best work, are getting 10% of their donations from the uh, uh, the internet. The average nonprofit organization is getting three, four percent. Okay, uh, that's going to change, and it's changing daily, weekly, month. But it'll be probably another 15 or more years before half of the contributions come in from uh, uh, the internet. So direct mail is still the workhorse of direct marketing. It is still the, the workhorse. Now, having said that, the internet, to this day, most people don't understand what is unique about the internet. In the history of the world, uh, Jeremy, there are only five five technologies that allow people to have kind of mass communication with, with the public in a short period of time. Uh, first was Gutenberg's printing press, uh, then movable type to allow you to have uh, periodicals, newspapers, magazines. Third is radio, fourth is television, the fifth is the internet. Each one of these has unique properties. No one ever bought a book to learn about current events. You don't buy television to listen to music. You can do that, but that's not why you buy it. Bought the television. Uh, radio is the sound of the human voice. Television is moving pictures. America's number one pastime used to be baseball not so anymore it's football better pictures okay uh so what is unique about the internet and if you don't understand this you're going to lose a lot of money on the on the internet and what is unique about the internet has a property not found in these other five or four technologies it is interactive you don't interact with a book you don't interact with radio newspapers television etc you do interact so that uh if you're in a nonprofit uh, public policy, area, it's easy to put polls out there, surveys, petition, quizzes, etc. Uh, and the same with in the commercial world. You know, you can have all kinds of things. You know, quizzes about the, your product, about the history of this uh, uh, field or that field. And there's lots of ways to be interactive, give people information. So most people treat the, their uh, website as a brochure site. Uh, so that uh, I go there today, that's fine, but I don't need to go back tomorrow, next week, next month, you know, give them a reason to come back. Uh, I gave our local newspaper here, the Washington Post, a dollar and a half today. Wasn't crazy about it, but I did. And I'm going to give them another dollar and a half tomorrow because they have this terrible habit of changing the paper. If they quit changing the paper, I wouldn't have to give them you know, another dollar and a half every day. So uh, make your site interactive, okay? Another uh, key element uh, about the Internet is most of our uh, 
I think a pop-up just came up <laughs> there. I had to <laughs> send it away. Uh, tell me I've got a doctor's appointment in a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, Jeremy, the uh, people, these silos, okay? I was talking to uh, a bunch of marketers a few years ago, and I make the point about uh, make sure you knock down the silos and that you interact your internet and your website with your direct mail, your phone, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, and somebody came up to me afterwards. A friend said, "Wow, that was a revelation, Richard. We've got a uh, a mailing signed by the vice president of the United States talking about this urgent problem, but we don't mention it on our website." Hello, <laughs> you know. So people. Uh, by the way, a third of the people in the nonprofit area will go to the uh, internet to check you out. They might go to your website, they might Google you, whatever it might be. But before they write a check, then about a third will go to the internet and, and, and get some information about you, okay? And so if you tell them about you've got a big problem or a big opportunity, and they go to the website, and there's nothing there, there's a disconnect, okay? So we want a seamless, uh, you know, marketing effort here. Your phone should be connected to your internet, you know, and direct mail. So everybody's, you know, together and singing off the same page there. Yeah, yeah. And I had two more questions, Richard, but it sounds like, do you have a doctor's appointment you have to get no, to I'm now? Fine. Okay. Uh, I can wait and do, go a few more Okay. Minutes. I, you know, uh, I wanted to hear about, obviously, you know, talking about you're a pioneer in the industry. I want to hear two things. One, what's been a low point in your life and how you fought through it? And then a proud moment. Start with um, what's been a low point in your life and how you got through those, that specific tough time. The, uh, well, without, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, usually it seems like low points uh, are very personal, so I won't, won't go into uh, this, but I will say that uh, Winston Churchill, about the last speech he ever gave, uh, was before a large audience, 50,000 people in, in the United Kingdom there. And they knew he was elderly, wasn't going to probably live much longer. And their people came, a small little town, 50,000 people showed up to hear this speech. And it's well known. Uh, he started with a very soft voice saying, never give up, never give up. And he began to repeat himself, just the same thing, never give up. But each time he said it, he raised his voice. And at the end of his speech, five, six, seven minutes, he's screaming, never give up, never give up, never give up and that's been kind of a hallmark of, of my life uh, whether it's personal uh, problems mm -hmm. business problems you know if I know that I'm right and I'm really clear in my, my thinking you know I, I won't give up and it's and I've, uh, my faith is very very important to me and uh, so uh, if I'm uh, clear with my God uh, and, uh, and I'm doing the right thing you know, never, never give up and keep keep faith that it will work out. And I, uh, some people in the office have a saying that, uh, you know, the well-known saying, God looks after little children and drunks. Well, people in my company have modified it. God looks after little children, drunks, and Richard. <laughs> and uh, it really has worked. Uh, and, and, and walk your faith and, uh, and never, never, never give up. Yeah, I remember hearing that story. It is a powerful story. I think it was was in Missouri that that speech was. No, uh, a friend of ours who uh, uh, I won't mention his name <laughs> said that to where you and I were recently, yeah. but they uh, but he was it was wrong. Uh, in Missouri, he gave his uh, famous uh, Iron Curtain speech. Uh, oh, okay. Forty-six. He uh, Truman was president, and, he, and Truman took him to a, a Fulton uh, uh, College in uh, uh, Missouri and made his famous, uh, you know, uh, a, a Iron Curtain is falling uh, across Europe there. But that speech came in the early fifties. I see. So, Richard, but, what was a time that you felt like giving up, and that that when it entered your brain to never give up? You now, Jeremy, I'm not sure that I. Uh, I ever have had a, a you know feeling of, of never giving up. I just I'm a person of, of great faith, and I just uh, yes, it's tough out there. It really gets tough, uh, and but I just would never ever you know give in to, uh, to uh, you know a feeling of, of despair. Uh, and uh, you know I feel that uh, you know being a per having a despair and despondency and uh, and feeling giving up is uh, is walking away from your faith i just don't have that that uh option and that's one of the reasons why i'm uh so uh active right now is i read that bible 
from beginning to end, and I can't find the word retire in there. Uh, and I'm <laughs> called to, uh, I'm not called, excuse me, to succeed, but I am called to try. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, as long as I'm focused on, uh, you know, uh, putting forth the right effort, the results are not up to me, they're up to, to God. I'm called to, to be faithful and to uh, put forth my best effort. And I enjoy doing that every day, every minute of every day. So what about proud moment? What's been one of the proudest moments you've had in your career? Well, you know, I think uh, election night, November 1980, uh, when uh, Reagan uh, was elected, we had for 24 years, we've, every two years, we've had a big election party at, at our offices starting in 1966. And uh, we had a big election night party at our office. We had a great address in those days uh, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, 7777 Route 7. <laughs> and uh, we had national media everywhere. Most of the network cameras were there, national radio. And uh, I watched friends of mine who'd never had a drink in their life, I don't think, have a glass of wine that night. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a very heady uh, thing. Uh, the uh, uh, And, you know, I was one of the founders of something called the New Right. And uh, we started around in the mid-1970s. And when we started, we were criticized and attacked, quite frankly, by conservatives, not just Republicans, conservatives. But we knew we were doing the right thing. We knew uh, that uh, we couldn't continue to operate politically as we had in the past. And we began to do things like direct mail and, uh, and be proactive. And, 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 and we literally said, we, those of us, uh, meeting at my home for nine, ten years. We are the alternative to the Democrats, not the Republicans. And we said it long enough, off enough, uh, the political community bought into it. Uh, and uh, all of that criticism went away, of course, when Reagan was elected and the fruits of our effort could be uh, observed by everybody. And uh, so if you're doing the right thing, you know, ignore the criticism. It's one of the things that I've uh, I've learned over the years, I will not let my opponents, my enemies, uh, dictate my, my actions, okay? Uh, I've never been one that uh, uh, is afraid to be criticized uh, because... I feel like you, if you're in politics, it oh, like yeah, comes with the territory. It, it does come with the territory. You'd be surprised how many people can't handle that. Uh, they don't want to be criticized in the, uh, in the newspaper or on television. Uh, but I'm, uh, and, and I've got, I'm well grounded. I know uh, uh, what I'm doing. And I know I'm doing the right thing. And uh, I'm not going to let my opponents, my political enemies, uh, dictate my, my actions. Mm. And that's hugely important. Jeremy, I am going to have to rush. Yeah, to my I just want you to finish with, just tell people where they can find out more about you and uh, what, what site should we point them towards? Yeah, I have a, a blog website uh, called uh, conservativehq.com. Mm -hmm. And it's unique. It's the only website out there that's focused on relaunching, building the conservative movement. So if you're interested in the conservative movement, conservative politics, uh, go to conservativehq.com. And this is my book, by the way. Hold uh, it up a little bit. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Take over. And uh, it's available on Amazon. And uh, it's uh, the it's a, also a hole in the marketplace. It's the only book uh, ever uh, uh, printed, uh, written that deals with the Civil War exclusively in the Republican Party. So you want to know the history of this, where we are now, and where we're going to go, and how conservatives can take over the Republican Party, govern America in a few years. You're going to find it in, in takeover here. Uh, the um, our company with 80 employees uh, is American Target Advertising, and you can uh, reach uh, me at uh, uh, my initials, uh, R-A-V, at, uh, excuse me, R-A-V, A-T-A, my company's initials, at AOL.com, okay. R-A-V, A-T-A, at AOL.com. Richard, thank you. I want to be the first one. I want you to keep living longer, so go to your doctor's appointment. I really appreciate it. This Thank has you. been a great experience. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm invited. Thank you.